Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm an immigrant from India and I'm a graduate of California's public schools. I was really cute once, this is me. And as you can, if you can see the picture of me picking out the class pumpkin, that's Mrs. Hensley and I'm picking out the class pumpkin for my third grade class. Today, I'm a historian of the period between the revolution and the civil war. And, and as an immigrant, I feel fortunate that I can be part of the story of America, both through my life, but also that I play a role in telling that story to others. My family arrived in the San Francisco Bay Area where my aunt and uncle had moved following the 1965 Immigration Act, which opened up the United States to people from around the world. We're dealing now with the benefits, but also some of the challenges of those changes today in our politics and culture. But for me as a young child, as this picture shows, I felt very much like it was just so great to just be a kid in America in the 70s. I had my Superman shirt. I had my pumpkins. My parents taught me that we should be grateful to, to be here in the United States, that America opened itself up to us and in return, we should embrace our new home. After a short stint near the Naval Air Station in Alameda, my family moved across the hills into the East Bay suburbs of San Francisco where my parents still live. On my block, it was a court, had all kinds of families. We had Protestant and Catholic and unobserving people. We had Japanese American and Irish American and, Catholic and German American. And of course, we ourselves were new Americans from India. People had all kinds of jobs. We had neighbors with graduate degrees and some who had never gone to college at all. But yet we all came together. We celebrated New Year's, Easter, and the 4th of July together as a neighborhood. On Christmas, the kids would come out to show off our new toys and to play. And of course, most of us went to the local public school. That school taught us to be Americans. In school, we learned to celebrate diversity. I remember my mother coming in and introducing my friends to Indian food. Remember, this is the 70s. Indians started migrating really in the late 60s, early 70s. But we were also taught that America belonged to all of us. I remember as a young person never being told that pilgrims, founding fathers, or anyone else didn't belong to me because I wasn't white. They were mine. We'll come back to this, but today it often feels like both from the right and the left, there are people who want to take my sense of belonging away from me, and I want to come back to that. Nor was I ever told because I was a recent migrant, I wasn't responsible for the evils of slavery or racism. We were part of a shared nation with a shared heritage, both in the formal curriculum and through various activities from field trips to pumpkin patches, Christmas season recitals. We were socialized in common, native born and immigrant, well off and less so. Now this is no doubt at some level an idealized memory. Many students experiences do not, did not fit that picture. Our schools are segregated by race and economic background. But I would contend that, that story, my story has some truth to it too. And I hope it resonates with some of you. A lot is happening recently in our country around public education. Our public schools right now are ground zero for America's culture wars. We have debates over how to think about race, how to think about sexuality, how to think about gender, how to think about history, which is my field. We are, I think, at a crossroads actually in the history of public education. We're asking fundamental questions about the kinds of schools we want, how they should be paid for, and ultimately what public education itself is for. Given the expansion of charter schools, it's entirely possible that in some states, the public schools that we know of and think of, that generations have taken for granted, will not be here a decade from now as parents choose schools that reflect their family values rather than the kind of common values that I was talking about earlier. Whether that emerges, and, and whatever emerges in the wake of what might happen is better, I leave to others. I wanna to think today about how we got to this point and what we as a nation might think about as we move forward in our own history of how we educate our young people. In other words, I wanna do what historians do best, provide a little bit of context. So today I wanna to ask and hopefully give some tentative answers to two questions. The first is, why did Americans after the revolution believe it was necessary to have public common schools? And I draw my answer to that question from my book, Democracy Schools. And so I'm pulling there from, from, from that book. And then the second part I wanna end it with is why are we losing faith today? What's happened historically that has led us to the point we're at now? And I'll provide some tentative answers to that. 
why do we have public schools? Well, I have Ben Franklin up there with, with his putative quote, a republic if you can keep it, which is what he said supposedly as he walked out of the Constitutional Convention. The if you can keep it part is why we have public schools. Ultimately, we live in a democracy and citizens need to be educated to fulfill their duties. That's why after the American Revolution, so many states included clauses in their constitutions mandating public support for education. Democracies require more of us as citizens than other kinds of governments. Our job as citizens is not just to obey, but to participate in self-rule. We don't live in an empire or a kingdom. We're not subjects, we're citizens, as David Wallstriker evidently talked about earlier. I didn't know it when I arrived in America as a young child, but I was joining a two centuries long experiment in whether a diverse and large group of people could govern themselves. But interestingly, today, faith in democracy itself is weakening. A recent poll found that only 30% of millennials think that living in a democracy is essential. One observer thought this might be because for millennials growing up in a country that is, has huge inequalities, divided by culture wars and partisanship, where gridlock and self-interest seem to triumph against the common good, many young people don't see democracy as a fundamental part of their lives. And as we saw on January 6th, Thousands of Americans, including some of our elected leaders, are willing to support violence and even lies to rather than the, accept the outcome of a fair election. We've come very close to losing democracy, a republic if you can keep it. This is a particularly dangerous moment because around the world, democracy is at a global low. China has proven to the world that one can achieve the benefits of markets without political and spiritual freedom. And many people in the world are happy with the bread and circus and particularly unelected leaders. This is something the Soviet Union never could accomplish. But America has always stood for more than wealth. Our commitment was not just to wealth, but to freedom. And freedom required, we believed, self-rule. The generations between the revolution and the civil war did not take freedom for granted. They were acutely aware that republics are among the most fragile of political regimes. Unlike empires, which last hundreds of years, in 1776, there were few examples of long lasting republics. That's why Thomas Jefferson and others argue that public schools would be vital to the American experiment. The primary motive to expand public education was to offer citizens the kind of liberal education in the arts and sciences that had once been reserved for an elite. If we're all citizens, we all need a broad education in the arts and sciences because we all need to be equipped to handle complex questions. This is the primary reason why Americans after the revolution believed we have to have public schools. In Massachusetts in their state constitution, it said it right there, wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue, ethics, a commitment to the public good, diffused generally among the body of the people being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties. And as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people. And that's a big deal, everyone. It shall be the duty of legislatures and magistrates in all future periods of this Commonwealth, meaning Massachusetts, to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences and all seminaries of them. Thomas Jefferson believed that once ordinary Americans had access to the kinds of knowledge that elites had once monopolized, they would be better prepared to govern themselves and to keep a watch over powerful elites. Of all his goals, Jefferson wrote in his bill for the diffusion of knowledge in Virginia, these are his words, none is more important, none more legitimate than that of rendering the people the safe as they are the ultimate guardians of their own liberty. It is notable also that many founders believe that girls should go to school. While they did not advocate equality in the way that we will come to understand it, they did believe that girls who would become mothers were responsible for both the intellectual and the moral formation of the next generation. In America's early public schools, particularly in the North and Northwest, girls and boys attended at similar rates. Moreover, private academies were established to offer girls access to higher education, the equivalent of what boys might learn in a high school or college. And many young women had their first experiences with the arts and sciences with liberal education, thanks to these public schools and private academies. And many of these women would go on to become active citizens 
even if they did not have the vote. So even if people didn't imagine the kind of political and social equality we would come to imagine, they did imagine that everyone needed, every child needed access to public education if they were to be effective citizens and ethical citizens. And that's the point I'm trying to make in this first point. To our founders, to the founding generation, people were not just born capable of being good citizens. They had to be prepared for their role as citizens. The primary motive for many Americans after the revolution to expand education was civic. Democracies require educated citizens. To be educated requires access to the liberal arts and sciences, subjects that prepare Americans to grapple with the kinds of issues that citizens would need to understand and leaders would have to face. This is important because today we tend to say we use our schools to prepare people for the workforce. We worry that they're not learning the right kinds of skills. But Americans between the revolution and the Civil War wanted students to have a very different kind of education, a more general education. Just to give you a sense, Jefferson proposed in Virginia that at the elementary level, students would learn reading, writing, arithmetic, as well as some knowledge of history, science, and ethics. For those who continued on to higher levels, they would learn ancient and modern history, math, physics, chemistry, anatomy, medical theory, zoology, botany, mineralogy, philosophy, legal ethics, and what we today would call political science and economics. This wasn't because these things weren't useful. It was because Jefferson thought they were the most useful things for citizens in a democracy to have at, available to them. Now in the 1830s, we start to see another purpose added to the civic. And that's what's called self-culture. Now, reformers like William Ellery Channing, who was one of the founders of Unitarianism and a prominent minister of his era, argued that access to a liberal education in the arts and sciences, the humanities and the sciences, was, the, was an obligation in any society that considered itself to be Christian and democratic. Because if you believe in equality, then God's world, he would argue, would be, should be accessible to every person. Every child, he thought, had the image of God within them. Every person deserved an education. In 1838, he wrote, you deserve an education. Every child deserves an education because he is a man, a human, not because he is to make shoes, nails, or pins. He continued, there are those who would say a liberal education is needed for men who are to fill high stations, but not for such as are doomed to vulgar labor. But then he asked, isn't it true that each of us is a son a husband, father, friend, and Christian. And we would add, of course, a daughter, a partner, a neighbor. Each of us, he continues, belongs to a home, a country, a church, a race. Education shouldn't just prepare some of us to lead flourishing lives and leave others to toil. In a democracy, we must all be educated to fulfill our various roles in society. And that means developing all our capabilities. So those are two reasons now. The civic was the primary reason, but by the 1830s, we had this democratic ideal of self-culture that we should develop each person's innate cap capabilities because equality demanded it of us, that each person should be able to look upon God's world with, with, with educated eyes. But in the 1830s and 40s, there was a third reason, and this is my last reason from this early period that I wanna add, which is the to explain the expansion of public education. And that was the expanding diversity of the American population, particularly the influx of Irish immigration. As America became more diverse, many education reformers, including Horace Mann, the secretary to Massachusetts's Board of Education and the so-called founding father of American public education, thought a diverse society needed public schools to bring citizens together and to help them see each other as Americans. They imagine that kind of picture I showed of myself in, in elementary school, right? Where all kinds of people from all around the world are together in the same spaces. And this was particularly true to them as Americans confronted ethnic and racial conflict in the 1830s and 40s, some of it quite violent as in anti-Irish riots. Our public schools are the most democratic institutions that this peculiarly democratic country affords 
proclaimed E. Hodges, who was superintendent of schools in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin in 1854. Public schools, he thought, would treat all children equally, educating them not just in the rudiments, but with the knowledge necessary for citizenship. But in a society divided by religion, ethnicity, party, and wealth, he added, public schools would, and these are his words, harmonize the various discordant elements that are found in society as students sympathize with and for the other. And I love that term, sympathize with and for the other. Those are his words. Immigrants would learn America's, and this is a quote, customs, assume their manners and become homogenous with them. The equality upon which they would be placed in the public schools and the discipline which they should they therefore there receive would Americanize them in the shortest possible time. Ohio's Calvin Stowe told a gathering of the Western Literary Institute in 1836 that, these are his words, unless we educate our immigrants, they will be our ruin. And he continued, to sustain an extended republic like our own, there must be national feeling, a national assimilation. And he thought that common schools funded by taxes, free for all people, overseen by citizens, would bring this diverse society together. The schools would in fact serve as a glue binding Americans to each other. And I want to be clear, it wasn't just immigration that worried reformers like Stowe. Economic inequality was grow in growing in the decades before the Civil War. And people worried if well-off parents could opt out of the public schools, the schools would become pauper schools, charity schools, undermining their public purposes. John Pierce, who was the state of Michigan's superintendent of public instru instruction said, Americans had a duty to render the advantages of common schools to all classes and conditions of society. Actually, that was, that was a group of educators I just quoted in Orange County, New York. John Pierce said, public schools should be places where, quote, all classes are blended together. The rich mingle with the poor and are educated in company and mutual attachments are formed. Again, this sense of mutualism. New York's free school society concurred and said that common schools are places, quote, where the rich and poor may meet together. Horace Mann considered bringing rich and poor together to be one of the most important functions of public schools. If rich parents turn away from the common schools, he wrote, and choose to send their kids to the private school or the academy, these are this, those were his words, the poor would end up with a second class education. To ensure that students and their parents intermingle, he wrote, there should be a free school sufficiently safe and sufficiently good for all the children within its territory or district. That last word territory mattered a lot to man. The children who live together within the same district should attend the same schools. Segregation, especially of rich and poor, would hurt all children by increasing inequality and reducing social solidarity. And it should be noted, that these people were writing at a time where American society was quite violent. From frontier vigilante violence in the West to anti-Catholic violence in urban centers to race riots, Americans fought in the streets and against each other. There was partisan violence and members of Congress started carrying guns with them into the Capitol. Slavery, of course, depended on daily violence. Scholars have long argued that democratic societies depend on social trust, on the level of confidence that Americans have in each other. As Americans looked around their nation in the 1830s and 40s, and certainly by the 1850s, they had reasons to be concerned. They hoped that the public schools would not just help Americans prepare for citizenship, but could bring a diverse, diverse nation together and hold it together. Was that too much to ask? It was no easy task. Perhaps it goes without saying that African Americans in the South were not included. They learned to write, read and write if they learned it at all in secret. Sometimes they learned for white, from whites, but often from one another. Enslaved people caught teaching someone to read could face death, but yet they did learn. In the North, African-Americans argued for integrated schools, but the trend was actually against them. In the decades before the Civil War, many African-Americans in the North lost the right to vote. Northern states and communities had both integrated, but many also had segregated schools. But Northern African Americans recognized the importance of integration on the way in which public schools not only made people Americans, but determined who counted as an American. 
Take the case of Boston's Benjamin Roberts. Roberts was trained as a shoemaker and became an anti-slavery activist. He had a five-year-old daughter in 1847, and he watched her walk by white-only schools and recalled how he had felt when he had to do so as a child. These are his words. The pupils of the several schools as we passed took particular notice of our situation, and we were looked upon by them as unworthy to be instructed in common with others. In other words, it was by being denied membership, access to shared schools, that one was identified as not being a full citizen. He did not want his daughter to experience the same feelings of exile that he had. And he and other advocates of integration took their case to the Massachusetts Supreme Court. The court actually upheld segregated schools, but activists, black and white, convinced the state legislature to overturn that decision five years later in 1849. Or five years later, the court upheld in 1849 and then the legislature acted. But if African Americans wanted in, many Catholic Americans wanted their own schools. Like many Americans today, especially religious conservatives from various faiths, Catholics argued that the public schools were unsafe places for the moral development of their children. Some priests considered excommunicating parents who sent their children to public schools. In cities across the nation, Catholic leaders and parents asked for public funding for parochial schools, vouchers in today's language, so that their children could learn their faith, and also because the public schools were biased against Catholicism. And this was no small thing, anti-Catholicism. Protestants rioted against Catholics in this period of American history, and at least one reason for expanding public education was to Americanize Catholic immigrants. At a time when Protestants argued Catholic, the Catholic Church remained hostile to both democracy and the separation of church and state. But on the other hand, the majority of Catholic children attended public schools and learned alongside their fellow Americans, native born and immigrant. But the arguments Catholics made then echo the arguments that religious conservatives are making today. In a diverse society, parents should choose schools that reflect their values, their faith. The big question we have to ask ourselves, and I'll come back to this, is whether American diversity means that we should allow families to choose their schools, or whether our diversity makes coming together in common institutions even more important than ever. In the antebellum era, African-American and Catholic leaders answered that question differently. So just to recap, three reasons why we expanded public schools in America. The primary one was citizenship, but there was also this ideal that all citizens needed to be able to develop themselves in a society committed to equality. And there was also this idea that part of, a, of the civic purpose of schools was creating social solidarity, Americanizing all people, native born and immigrant in common institutions. Why have we lost the faith today? Today, we're less certain that public schools are that important or even that education is a public good. Former Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos argued that families, not society, should make, parental, should make the decisions about education, a point being taken up again as parental rights. At the same time, many political and business leaders from the right and left have argued that schools should prepare Americans for work, not citizenship. And there are two big reasons I want to suggest for this loss of faith. Economic globalization, and our increasing diversity. So let me turn to the first. We often use our schools to fight what we consider to be the biggest challenge of our era, to meet, I should say, the biggest challenge of our era. For the founders of our nation, the question was whether citizens were capable of self-government. During the Cold War too, the United States was engaged in a contest over whether democracy or communism was a superior system. That meant educating for democracy was extremely important to our leaders and citizens. But today we worry most about economic questions, about the rise of China, whether globalization is eroding our economic competitiveness. And for many Americans at a time where good jobs are hard to find and corporations can outsource, American citizens and leaders are rightly concerned and worried about how to create a vibrant economy and how to get ahead in a global, and what it sometimes feels, an economy with declining opportunities. 
that brings economic concerns to the fore. And these concerns have been spurred by international rankings that have placed other countries' schools ahead of America's. Will we be able to compete? If the founders asked, will we be able to keep the Republic? We are now asking, will we be able to compete? We see this in the Common Core and other state standards. According to America's leaders today, the real test of a public school success is whether students graduate college and career ready. And the real purpose of college, they would argue, is to prepare people for jobs. So we really mean career ready. I want to say this is a real lowering expectations of our schools, no matter how much we talk about standards. And I want us to say this is a recent change as well. If we think back just to the first Bush administration, the National Educational Goals Panel, organized by the first Bush administration concluded that higher academic achievement would prepare students for, quote, citizenship, further learning, and productive employment. So citizenship, further learning, or self-culture, and, and productive employment, all three. And it would do this through engagement in what the National Education Goals Panel called challenging subject matter, including English, mathematics, science, foreign languages, civics and government, economics, arts, history, and geography, and teaching students, and this is their phrase, to use their minds well. Another Bush era document worried that poor and minority students, quote, have not been introduced to literature because the focus has been on basic skills. That sounds downright Jeffersonian, but that was the end of the Cold War and the Cold War kind of framework was still shaping us. Today, the emphasis on the economy and we talk about skills and we've forgotten these other aspirations that were still alive in the first Bush administration. Instead, as in the words of a Dayton, Ohio Chamber of Commerce member said about public schools, the business community is the consumer of the educational product and students are the educational product. And this is a bipartisan consensus. Arne Duncan, President Obama's education secretary stated in 2012, our president knows education is about jobs, not citizens, but workers. Now, to be clear, I believe that we have a responsibility to prepare people for work and a healthy economy is a public good. What concerned me is not that we care about economic outcomes, but that we have whittled away those other aspirations that were still alive during the first Bush administration, lowering our expectations of what public schools are for. And what about diversity? Diversity is one of America's greatest strengths but it's also one of America's greatest challenges. Democracies require us to feel a sense of solidarity, mutualism, fellow feeling, to see ourselves as a common people who trust each other, who can work together. Not all governments require as much. Empires can rule diverse societies because they want peace and wealth and are, use, are willing to use force to get it. The same is true of authoritarian regimes, but democracies require each of us to see ourselves in each other as fellow citizens, to cooperate, to win, and to lose elections gracefully. Diversity brings vibrancy, innovation, and talent to a society. In a democracy such as ours as well, we respect rights. So we want people to be free to choose their faith and to pursue lives that they value. Diversity is a product of our freedom, but it's also a threat to our capacity to work collectively to protect it. And that's the challenge. In the 19th century, Protestants were the majority. And so while the schools were not always explicitly religious, they drew deeply on Americans' Protestant background culture. For Catholics, Jews, and non-believers for much of our history, the public schools were not welcoming places. That started to change in the 20th century. In response today, an increasing number of American evangelicals have opted out of the public schools as Catholics did in the 19th century because they believe the schools are not good places for their children's faith. In her home state of Michigan, Betsy DeVos led the movement to move funds and students away from public schools. She supported not just charter schools, but voucher programs to allow families to send their children to religious schools with tax dollars. But the left too has started to question whether we can be one nation. Inspired by ideas that if we're honest have roots in critical race theory, or how it has been popularized, popularized through such works as Ibram Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist, left-leaning educators have, like conservatives, demand, determined that American history and culture cannot belong to all of us. It cannot be 
ours, the way I felt it was when I was a child growing up in the 70s. Today, many educators are unwilling to socialize children into a shared American life because they find it racist to do so. They believe it reflects what they call deficit thinking, that it's racist rather than welcoming to ask non-white immigrants to become part of the country. Common holidays like Halloween and Thanksgiving no longer belong to all of us and schools are hesitant about celebrating them. They're rebranded as belonging to white people or Protestants. Some on the left have gone so far to say that most of American history is really white history. And the outcome of this thinking on the left is not that different from what is happening on the far right. The left is privatizing our common culture and history, parceling it out to each racial and ethnic group rather than allowing us to belong to the same country. In Illinois, a state legislature called, quote, for the abolishment of history classes in the state's public schools because the course materials, quote, lead to white privilege and a racist society. So we're seeing on the left and the right, these different movements that are leading us to question whether we can engage in the kind of socialization that had been seen as fundamental to public schools. I did not grow up that way. For me, what made America stand out was that a brown kid like me could become American, not white. But from the right and the left, as we become more diverse, there's been a loss of faith that we can all be one people, that we can educate our kids in common, in common schools that social all, socialize all of us together as fellow Americans. In conclusion, I wanna just say that none of the questions that we have faced during the founding decades of our Republic have gone away. And in some ways they are more relevant than they have ever been. At a time when democracy's future appears uncertain at home and abroad, it is worth remembering the founders' admonition that republics are fragile and depend on educated and ethical citizens and leaders. At a time of growing diversity, when violence once again seems to be breaking out on our streets, we must once again ask ourselves, do we see ourselves as fellow Americans? Are we able to find enough common ground to educate our children in common schools? Our democracy needs us to care for each other, but to do so, we must have and share common ideals and traditions that bind us together as Americans across class, religious, ethnic, and partisan lines. So what I've shared with you today are some of the concerns and dreams of the founding generations of our Republic and of the founders of our common schools. I think that their concerns, but also their dreams should become ours once again. Thank you. Thanks, Johan. And what I'm going to encourage people to do is uh, to put questions into the chat. I can see that Rebecca Noel already has her hand up. I'm going to get to you in one second, Rebecca, since you, you, um, you're the first person that I'm seeing. Uh, I just want to say um, not only thank you to Johan for being here tonight and for the presentation and, and for being with us for the discussion that's coming up. I also wanted to um, also remind people this is a program that's uh, and that has been brought to you in part by the National Endowment of the Humanities, and we really appreciate their support for this. And it's also been brought to you by people like you. Many of you are, are our supporters as well. So thank you. Um, and we hope to um, continue having programs like this. If you're interested in finding out more about the, the organization, the uh, New Hampshire Humanities Organization, please look at nhh.org. Uh, I'm sorry, did I just looking whether I just shortened the, the name of it? Um, this is what happens at the end of the day. Uh, please take, take a look at our website uh, to find out about more programs or to continue to support programs like this. So just wanted to put that in. Final word is that you will be getting um, a survey at the end of the program. Uh, we do encourage you to do this. This is how we learn about what you think, what you're thinking about the, the ideas, and also what you're thinking about the programs and the way we're running them. Particularly, how much are you a fan of five o'clock on Friday night or not a fan of uh, five o'clock on Friday night? That's something we are always worried about. So um, looks like uh, there's some questions coming in, but it looks like Rebecca, you were the first person in line if you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Thank you. That wasn't actually a question. Those were the clappy hands. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. I, I saw that. Yes, I apologize. Yeah, but uh, don't give me the microphone because I will use it. Uh, I, I just wanted to say congratulations to Johan. That was a terrific talk. And I love how you put these really big, vital, crucial, urgent questions into historical sweep and it, it's so important for uh, New Hampshire Humanities um, to do this kind of uh, presentation. And um, I uh, I think, you know, you just made it so 
so vital. And I, I suppose I, I could ask so many questions and not, uh, you know, of course, but one question I would have is, uh, what happens when you give this talk to people on the left? Because uh, I can imagine an audience saying, um, you know, the founders weren't thinking about enslaved children. They said every child needs an ed education, but they didn't mean it. Uh, so I, I can imagine challenges to your talk from a number of directions, but how, how would you respond to that challenge? I'd say it's true. When they, you know, there's two, two things, and I hope I made clear that it was true in the talk. You know, I think the enslaved people, for example, would learn in pit schools or they would secretly go to people who knew how to read um, at risk, at great risk to themselves to ensure that there were literate people within their communities. Um, and racism is not something that's made up, right? Um, I think we have to approach this from two perspectives. We have to see what were the limits of the public schools. But the danger we should not fall into is in understanding those limits identifying the project of common schools with those limits, but rather seeing those limits as the problems we need to overcome because the project itself is so important to the health of our democracy. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, whenever you're challenging or asking questions, I'm not so much challenging, I'm asking questions about things that are happening on the left and right. We're asking about things that we really want or believe in or have faith in politically, and that, that's hard. If I can get in a question uh, here from us, uh, from Susan uh, Deshenis, uh, who asked um, in the chat, can you please speak to relatively new laws that restrict what can be taught in public schools? Sure. Um, I think there's multiple ways to answer that question. I mean, these are the suite of laws that have to do with teaching about specific theories about race, for example, or um, about gender and sexuality. And I think Whatever I may think about the appropriateness of what we teach, I think one of the things I argue in my book is that public schools are both sites where we advocate democratic education, but they're also um, democracy schools. They belong to all of us. And so I do not think it's inappropriate within the parameters of constitutional law. You know, this, both the state and federal constitutions protect the rights of students in certain ways. But within the parameters of that, for people on the right or left to ask questions about the curriculum, because the curriculum is political. It's how we socialize children. We shouldn't do it from a hateful spirit. We shouldn't do it um, in ways that are meant to target people, but we should be asking the questions, how do we want to socialize people? When do we want to teach them about sexuality? How do we want to teach about race or American history? Are the kinds of questions citizens in a democracy ask as the stakeholders in our public schools? And these are ultimately public entities that are governed by us. Mary, I, I don't know if you've unmuted because you were going to ask a question or if that was uh, something else. So, Mary, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce your last name. Rolt? Rolt? I'm sorry. All right. Um, if, if you don't have a, a question right now, I do have a question from Janet in the chat. Do you think parents on the right who send their children to private and religious schools believe in our democracy, is what Janet asks. I, I mean, I think many do. Um, there is a lot of evidence, for example, that, that has been done on studies of Catholic schools, that Catholic schools prepare engaged act citizens with a sense of obligation and duty to our democracy. Um, so, so that story is complicated. Um, but I also think what, what, what's being pushed against, and this comes from conservative Christians, but also Muslims and Jews in some contexts in different parts of the country as well, is the sense that the schools should be places that socialize us together. And when we socialize, when we make decisions about socialization, it's always gonna mean that there are people who feel that that is not describing the way they would bring up their children. And to be honest, so do I. I send my kids to the local public schools. I live in a fairly liberal area. So more often than not, when I, you know, if I was in a more conservative area, I think I would have certain challenges coming from conservatism. Where I live, I have certain challenges coming from liberalism. 
and it, and I, but I believe that the public that I'm part of has some obligation and duty, but also a role to play in shaping the development of citizens. So my concern is really that, you know, do we believe that and do we think we can achieve that if we parcel ourselves out by our belief systems rather than forcing ourselves to come together and contend over it? And I think that's the question I would ask. Looks like we have a question from Fran Taylor, who's talking about um, talking about districts that have large numbers of minority students, but but lowering their budgets. Uh, she describes it as putting an arrow into a highly effective ed program. Um, how how do you challenge this? How do you work with the, this kind of situation? I mean, I don't know the specifics of what that question is asking, but I know there's been a lot of work in various states to try to equalize funding between districts. Um, sometimes the needs in high, pov high poverty areas are higher, which is not the same as minority areas. Um, but I do think that, I think one of the things I fear is if we start seeing some schools as other people's schools and some schools as our schools, um, then that shared commitment to public funding will erode. That's what Horace Mann was worried about when he talked about if some, if some parents pull away from the public schools, they won't feel the incentive to pay the taxes because they'll see the people in the other schools as somehow not some groups of people they have a stake in. And I think we do see some of this as our schools are becoming resegregated. You know, schools are more racially segregated now than they were 30 years ago. And we are seeing some of that and it is a real problem. There was a, a question um, from uh, Alison Yablonko, uh, who was, I think, referring to, you had said something about the schools are more diverse now than ever, uh, the, the country is more diverse now than ever. Can you talk about how, um, in what way the USA is more diverse than it was in the 1970s? Well, I think, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that we've never not been diverse, you know, so if you go back to the 1780s, you have one of the earliest advocates of public education in Pennsylvania, Benjamin Rush worrying about how do we bring a diverse people together because so many Pennsylvanians were German speaking. And he worried that um, Pennsylvania was too diverse. Um, and so we've never, I think, had a moment where diversity was simply not an issue of us. We've, we've talked about religious diversity and religious diversity still is one of our challenges. Um, but after 1965, with immigration reform, you had, large numbers of migrants coming in from other parts of the world that had not traditionally been here. We've had Chinese migrants and Japanese migrants, of course, coming in earlier in the century, but suddenly people from, from south of the United States, as well as people like me from places like India started appearing. And it was a real novel change. And people brought with them, not just new faiths, new, cult, you know, new cultural traditions, um, new ways of thinking about the world, new ways of thinking about education as well. And, and those were challenges that we faced. So I think we've become much more ethnically diverse, but at the same time we had, and this is the other piece, right? After the, partly for good reasons. I mean, you know, people used, the, the, the schools in the 1920s were not welcoming places for a lot of people. So partly for good reasons, we've also responded to that with real uncertainty about how do we how, what do we do about that diversity? And I think we're struggling with that question. Do we say everyone just brings their diversity and we shouldn't to, to school and therefore we don't want to impose or coerce, people would say from the left, people to join a sort of common sense of Americanness? But for me, it wasn't coercion. It was the opening up of America to, to people like me. And that I feel we're losing. I mean, we're certainly losing it from certain kinds of parts of the right where I certainly wouldn't feel welcome. But I think we're also losing it for certain parts of the left that want to sort of say that the, what we should do with our diversity is parcel people out and let them just stay in different camps rather than say we share this country together. And that's actually what makes it so great. Got a question from uh, Carolyn Reno, um, and who's asking about the role of outside money. So the forces of, of people who advocate for policies in public education in, in different ways. Um, does that play a part in the widespread loss of faith in public schools? And what, is, what does that look like? 
Oh yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Yes, in two ways, right? There's outside money that is sort of shaping the culture wars, right? There's outside money um, that is funding, for example, um, Betsy DeVos's um, movement in Michigan. So there's that kind of money, but there's also the more kind of subtle ways in which there's a lot of money in public education and companies are trying to figure out how can they get access to it. And so part of it is privatizing more and more of the functions of public education. Some of it through software delivery systems, some of it through for-profit voucher schools and choice schools. So part of it is also taking our tax dollars and profiteering off of them. And that's deeply problematic, I think, partly because it means Partly because I believe in a democracy, as messy as a democracy is, the schools have to belong to us as citizens. And that means that we're going to argue over things like race and religion because we, because we are a diverse society, but they shouldn't be sites for profiteering. The, the motive should be civic when we engage with our public schools and when we operate them. So I was asking, uh, I'm Carolyn, I was asking what role that's playing in, in our losing our faith in a, in a subtle way. People might not even know what role, I'm, obviously I believe it is playing a big part, what role that is actually playing in making us, you know, trying to overthrow what's there. Um, I, think, I think you're right. I mean, I think it does play a role. I think it shapes the rhetoric, right? Big foundations and politically inclined think tanks are shaping the public rhetoric. They're funding movies, they're funding think tanks, they're funding um, policy briefs, they're funding, they place, so it shapes our rhetoric of school failure. Um, it shapes the agenda of politicians to sort of decide what counts as a successful school. It shapes the school choice movement and the prominence it has because most Americans generally are supportive of their neighborhood school, but then they think about public schools and they presume public education is failing and we need this, we need to have these solutions. So I think you're right. Like, like all things in our politics, the agenda that we see and the windows, the ways in which we, our perspectives are deeply shaped by money and who has money and how they spend it. No, I think that's a very good point. And, and it's a really important point because for a long, long time, Public education, like social security, was the thing you could not shake people's faith in, right? It was just everybody, Republican, Democrat, believed in public education. Taxes were always supported. You can't say that today. And that was a really hard project that came light, uh, where private funding played a large role in reshaping the rhetoric we have around public schools. Thank you. So I've got one online and then Charles, I see you. You're gonna be after this, this next question. So the question uh, from the chat is from Elizabeth De Brule. Um, so how can we successfully and consciously affect change in this field? How do we re-educate people who don't recognize our shared culture? How have major ideological shifts in education happened in the past? So it's a very, I like this because it's an active question. What do we do with this as a problem? That's a great question. Um, and if I could give you an authoritative answer to it that we could all run with, man. <laughs> but I do think this, I mean, this is what I will say. Um, when I said earlier that we use public education to meet the challenges that we see as most pressing, they set an agenda, you know, and, and I like, I do think two things have happened. One, the pandemic has enabled us, a lot of us to see that we're quite dependent on our public institutions we took for granted, that they're fragile. We used to think they were unmovable monoliths. If you talked about public schools, both the new left and the new right in the 70s and 80s talked about these bureaucracies that could never be changed. Today, we're seeing they're more tentative and fragile and they could actually disappear. So I think there's that. The other thing I think is we're seeing around the world, for better or for worse, this idea that democracy is not a given, freedom is not a given, that even in the United States, there's domestic threats to our democracy, but looking around the world, there are large threats to the to democratic nation states. And, and some of those threats are quite vibrant, like China. So I think those kinds of things shake people up. And even though we don't want to have like external threats guide us, just like the shift towards teaching for a workforce was caused by deindustrialization and globalization in the 70s and 80s, 
we're at a moment, I think, where maybe there will be a shift to say, actually, we need to invest in our public schools and reinvest in the civic purposes of our schools. And you're starting to see this in laws that talk about reinvesting in civics education at the federal and state level. So there is, you're starting to see some kinds of changes around this. So I'm, I, I'm hopeful for those changes, even though I'm always not happy what might be the causes for those changes. Go ahead, Charles, you, you um, have the next question. Yeah. Okay, thank you. My question is, how do you feel about standard curricula in the schools? Um, that seems to be a double-edged sword that there's a certain minimum understanding that we expect our kids to get in school, but we also expect teachers to have a lot of flexibility on how, how they interpret the curriculum. Um, so I was wondering if you have a good way to set my angst at ease on this. <laughs> um, I don't know that I do. <laughs> I mean, I think you said it right. It's a double-edged sword, right? Um, I think there's several things to think about. I mean, one is we know that our top public schools perform as well as the top public schools in every other nation, but we also have some of the greatest inequalities of wealth. So some of the change, the, some of the things we see in our, in how student test scores are distributed reflect changes external to public education and what public education can on its own resolve. The schools can't save us from all the problems in our society. We have to admit that and acknowledge that. I think that you're right. We do need some standards and some benchmarks especially in what might be easily accessible. When the first standards movement of the 80s was gaining speed, one of its great advocates was um, Diane Ravitch. And one of the things she said is she anticipated they'd be post, you know, they'd be like, um, you know, post holing, right? They'd sort of take some soundings, I'm shifting my, my, my metaphor here, but take some soundings to get a sense of where things are working, where they're not. They wouldn't be these high stakes tests that presume that they can evaluate the work of a particular teacher, because we know that in that context, they don't do their job. They just simply can't do that. And so people, um, what has concerned me is that the way these standards have been imposed with high stakes and high punishments in some states has meant history and science have been marginalized because they're not tested. And part of the civic purpose of education is to broaden our understanding of the world and our horizons. And whether your concerns are economic or civic, if we have people who don't have time to be inspired by and understand science and history, we've lost something. So that's why it's a double-edged sword. We have to consistently rebalance it. But if you over, you know, what happens when you overstate the standards is you get mechanical and, and the schools stop being places where teachers can interpret a curriculum and bring it to life in local context and it becomes a grind. And that, that doesn't do, you know, one of the things there's a there's an education scholar who said the best part about American public education, why we beat the world is because of, you know, the talent show. And what he said is we allow people with no talent to try it out. Um, right. And that means that we we cultivate creativity and we we have too much mandate. We'll lose these things that actually enable us to be a vibrant society. So it's that's really about constantly, you know, working with those balances because it's a double-edged sword, but it's not one that we can just totally do without either, right? So. Yeah. Let's see if we can get a couple more in. I, we realize we're over time. We appreciate everyone uh, kind of staying around for the conversation. Um, uh, Lewis Cote was asking, uh, what's the greater danger to the survival of public education? Is it the gross inequity of how public education is funded or is it the gulf between the sides in the culture world? That's a great question. Um, I think the answer is the greatest threat to our achieving the dream of public education, which means equal access to a high quality education is not just funding inequalities, which many states have tried to deal with actually quite effectively, although they still exist, but the inequalities of our society. It's the inequalities that mean that, that certain kinds of families will no matter what, be able to provide more resources to their children. And that's why one of the solutions has to be external to the schools. How do we economic, integrate across economic divisions, districts, 
And that's really hard because one of the ways in which we self-segregate is by buying, if we have the means, houses in neighborhoods with what we would think of as good schools. We don't always know they're better schools. They're schools with parents who have equipped their kids to do well in schools. Um, but I think the threat we're facing has to do with, your, with the great divide because that's what's preventing us from dealing with these other issues of public education because we're losing faith in fixing public education and investing in it. So for me, the threat is our, our cultural political wars because it means that there's a lot of people who are now saying we need to opt out, we need to, we need to break the system entirely, that the system itself is the problem. And while the system needs some fixes, and, and it's certainly not perfect, I think the faith we're losing has more to do with that than the economic inequalities, but the economic inequalities shape the success of the system. But that's, that's my take. Actually, you mentioned uh, in that answer, talking about uh, parents within schools and the choices parents make. We had a question from Sally Fellows about how the role of parents in public education has changed. In what ways has that changed? That's a great question. Um, I mean, parents have always been engaged in public schools. How could they not be, right? I think parents have often been the movers and shakers. If, if you go back to the 19th century, they're, even if the schools belong to all of us, it would often be the parents who are the ones volunteering for the school board, the local district school board. They would be the ones because they have a clear stake in, the well, in, the, in, the, in how those schools thrive. Even though I believe all of us as citizens, whether we have public school children or not, have a stake in how, how well our schools are doing. So parents have always been involved. Parents were involved in the 20s when we were having arguments over faith and religion. Parents were involved in the 50s and 60s when we were, when we were struggling with segregation and the way, in the wake of Brown v. Board and you had parents who would establish private schools or take their kids out of the public schools rather than integrate the schools. Parents have also been involved in positive ways, right? They're the ones who've often invested in serving on school boards and doing things that serve the entire community of those schools. So parents have been essential. What troubles me about the argument about parental rights is it suggests that the schools contract with parents rather than sustain the social contract. And I think what the schools do well is they, in a sense, launder, for lack of a better term, in a sense, our self-interest in our own children into an interest of caring for other people's children by our engagement with the school boards and our local school communities. And I know for me, I'm, in very, I'm involved in the schools because my kids are currently in the schools. And I don't always agree with what my schools do, but I'm invested in other people's children because I get to know the other parents, I get to know um, neighbors, I get to know other kids, but also because my kid is there. Um, and there's no denying that that creates an investment. The trick is how to make sure that investment is not, the selfishness of that, which is also with love of my kids, is not the only thing that happens. And that's, so what we're seeing with the parental rights movement is this idea that the kids are mine. And what we really wanna do is say, these kids belong to us and we care for all of them. And that's what the public schools were supposed to do. So we are coming up at 6.10. Do you have one, one more question, uh, Johan, or are you, uh, you tapped out um, at this point? <laughs> I can take it, but you know, and the nice thing about Zoom is I guess I won't feel, I mean, I will feel hurt, but people should feel free to leave if we're over time, but yeah, I'm yeah, happy if you want me to take one more question. I'm well, sitting here in my office in Bellingham, Washington, so. All right, well, we'll give you one more and, and we do appreciate everyone for hanging in there as, as uh, in hearing the, the discussion part of it this evening. Uh, we did have a question from Quinn Casella who was really asking about, I think part of your theme, right? What caused that move away from civic motivation in the schools? How, what really, spurred that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, two, I mean, I would say two things. One is the real crisis that the 70s and 80s posed to our economy and then global, as globalization took off in the 90s. There really was a crisis. Like, how do we build a vibrant economy? How do we provide opportunities that are no longer available? How, what is the 21st century economy? And how are we going to prepare people for it? This wasn't a pretend issue. It's a real issue. And so, that's one reason. So you have both corporate leaders, people like in Microsoft in my backyard, and you have policymakers saying, oh my gosh, we got to meet this challenge because we got to invest in, our, in, our, in ensuring that we have an educated workforce. So that was the real 
you know, and I think in many cases, very well-intentioned purpose. It just sidelined some of the civic purposes. And then the other is, it's the lowest common denominator. There's very few people who disagree with that, where the moment you talk about the civic or moral formation of citizens, you're in the world of moral politics, culture politics, partisan politics, and people, we tried that. We tried national standards, going back to that question. Um, the first George Bush and then the president, Bill Clinton, took it over, and they sort of blew up over the new in, proposed English standards and the proposed history standards and even the proposed math standards, right? Are they too liberal? Are they too conservative? And we couldn't agree. And so we shifted in our standards development to these skills that are in the common core, where they don't sort of say, let's learn this about American history. They say, let's learn these skills um, that are useful for workers, because we didn't know how to resolve this political cultural conflict we're faced with. Um, so, the, so economic criteria became our lowest common denominator, in a way. Well, thank you. Thank you, Johan, for being with us tonight. And thank you all for joining us in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, been... for being with me. I really appreciate it. I know you're all busy and have other things to do. So I, I, I'm just honored to be with everyone today. We really appreciate it. We hope you all have a good night. We will be sending out surveys. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Uh, and we hope you will be joining us. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I have the dates. This is you know where people prepared me. Friday, May 6th, uh, Lucy Saylor, uh, Salyer is talking about gun runners, Irish American Finians, and international battles over citizenship. And do save the date for Thursday, May 26th at 5 p.m. for uh, poet and author Claudia Rankin on citizenship. So uh, we hope you keep coming to these conversations. We're looking forward to it. And we appreciate you all being here tonight. Enjoy the rest of your Friday.